Well, good morning. Good morning. It is such a beautiful day to be in the house of the Lord. I am so glad that you are here. I'm Ramona Lynn Bethley, lead pastor of this great church. So good morning to you and those of you joining us online. You have picked a great, well, of course, every Sunday is a great day uh, to come to church. Amen. Uh, at least that's my opinion. <laughs> but, but today, especially because today... We are celebrating the Tom Payton Memorial Arts Festival, and, and that is exciting to have it back after two years of not being able to hold it. So this is the 54th year. I understand this is the first time we have diverged from the um, Super Bowl numbers. So apparently uh, <laughs> TPAF and the Super Bowl are the same age. But, um, but it is great because since 1967, we have been celebrating this arts festival and encouraging the use and understanding of artistic expression through canvas, through woodworking, through pottery and photography. And yes, we've even expanded it to include music and film and literature and drama and even the art of preaching. Who knew? Who knew that preaching was an art? But it is. <laughs> and this year is no exception as we welcome our speaker and guest pastor, the Reverend Ann Sutton. Thank you, Ann, for being here. She is not only a United Methodist pastor with 30 years of experience, but she is also an artist, as you will see a little later in the worship service. Anne rediscovered her love for art when she was on a mission trip to Cambodia with her church and she had taken some pictures and when she got the pictures developed she realized that you couldn't really see what she had seen and experienced. The photograph just could not tell the whole story. So the next time she went on mission, uh, she took a sketchbook and a pencil with her. And in fact, you will see uh, some of her sketchbooks in the back. And in fact, I encourage you uh, to do that. Not now, not now, but at the end of the worship service, <laughs> I encourage you to linger a bit and just peruse some of her work because it is absolutely stunning. It is beautiful. And so she recaptured that love of art that she will share with us today. Anne is now retired after uh, 30 years of ministry, and she and her husband Scott, there he is, Scott sitting with uh, her, her, her uh, pastor's spouse is sitting by my pastor's spouse. So there, there you go. So the, the two first men of the church, you know, <laughs> there they are together. Uh, but uh, Anne and Scott live and are now now retired and living in Lafayette. So we are delighted to have both of you here today helping us uh, celebrate again the Tom Payton Arts Festival. So as we begin, let us pray. God of all creation and wonder, we gather this day in your presence with expectation, hungry for an encounter with you eager to hear your word, ready to see your mighty works. Open our eyes and our ears to the presence of your Holy Spirit. May the seeds of your word scattered among us this morning fall on fertile soil so that it may take root in our hearts and in our lives and produce an abundant harvest for you. This we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. I invite you now to stand as we uh, <clears throat> share together in our call to worship, our opening hymn, and our affirmation of faith. What mysteries are there in God's world? Slow us down, Lord, so that we may catch a glimpse of you. Help us to not ignore your mighty acts. Open our eyes that we may see. Open our ears that we may hear. Open, Open our, our minds, minds that, that we, we may, may understand. understand. Amen. Amen. 
Our hymn of praise this morning is number 304, Easter People, Raise Your Voices. body let us affirm our faith this is the good news which we have received in which we stand and by which we are saved Christ died for our sins was buried was raised on the third day and appeared first to the women then to Peter and the twelve and then to many faithful witnesses we believe Jesus is the Christ the anointed one of God, the firstborn of all creation, the firstborn from the dead, in whom all things hold together, in whom the fullness of God was pleased to dwell by the power of the Spirit. Christ is the head of the body, the church, and by the blood of the cross reconciles all things to God. Amen. Natalie, you need to leave them one. We're talking about seeing with your heart, and she's got on heart sunglasses. That's perfect. <laughs> so you are sitting in my spot. I want you guys to start this morning by looking at this stained glass back here that we see every Sunday because we're so lucky. But I want you to look at it, and I want you to tell me what you see. One thing you see. People. A big eye, ooh. In a big volcano. I, I see a temple, I'm guessing. A bartender. I see a volcano, no. Raindrops! <laughs> Let's... So we all see different things, and those are all, oh, you have another thing. I see a measuring scale. I see, I see that, too. When I look at it, that's the very first thing I see. That's what my eye is drawn to. Um, okay, one more? No, not you. 
(laughs) (laughs) So we all see different things that are up there, and they're all true, right? What we see, a lot of times when we look at art, it's kind of widely known that we look at art with our hearts or our souls. Like when you see something in art that you like, that's your heart responding, your soul, not your brain, right? So what we're going to be reading about today in church is a verse that Jesus is kind of challenging us to do more seeing with our heart. And um, so I want you to think about that for a second. What if you looked at the people in your class like they were pieces of art? Would that be weird? It would be scary. I'm Okay, we're just counting now. So <laughs> I want you. I want you, as you go through this week, to think about the people you meet and looking at them with your heart, and how that may be different for each of us. What we see when we see other people, but if you are looking at people with your heart instead of your eyes and your brain, that means you're really seeing them, right? How would that change the world? You think? Yeah, you think about what's on their inside instead of their outside. Yeah, it's a hard question. It's okay. You can just think about it this week. Let's say a quick prayer. Dear God, thank you for helping us see the world with our hearts. Amen. Thank you, Emily. Let us turn to Father in prayer. Lord, we know that when Peter stayed focused on you and kept his eyes on you, he could walk on water. And then as soon as he became distracted by the storms around him, just like when we become distracted by the world, he began to sink. And so we ask that you help us to stay focused on you and leave our past behind us. You are a God of mercy and wisdom and creativity. And we ask that today you inspire us and help us to love you more as we seek for you. In Jesus' name we pray and sing this morning. Amen.
Amen, and thank you, choir. That was beautiful and perfect for this day. As we uh, join together in a time of prayer, the Lord uh, is, is great to be praised. He is worthy of our praise, of our prayers, of our thanksgiving, of our rejoices. And he wants to hear the prayers of his children, our needs, our thanksgivings, our concerns, our worries. And nothing is impossible for our Lord. So I invite you to uh, share prayer concerns with me. If you are worshiping with us online, drop them in the comment section. I will add them to my prayers for you this week. You know, this week we celebrated Earth Day, and it got me thinking that we really need to be in prayer for our environment. To pray for the farmers who make a living and provide for their families and ours by what they grow from the ground. Pray that we will be good stewards, better stewards of that which God has created. So let us pray. Almighty God, as we are made in your image, we give you thanks for the seed of creativity that you have planted within each one of us. We praise the clean lines of the sculpture for the complexity of the concerto, for the beauty of the poet's words, for the brush strokes, upon an artist's canvas for the craftsmanship of a potter or a woodworker for the creativity of those who labor behind a desk or in a classroom and for the bounty from those who toil in the sun and dirt and field to produce crops or just piddle in their garden for tomatoes or flowers. May each one, no matter our work, be mindful of our connection to you as our creator. So forgive us, Lord. Forgive us for those times when we have squandered with aimless disregard our capacity to create and for those times that we have used our creativity as a force of destruction rather than reparation. Help us truly to live in appreciative awe of the creativity that you have planted within each of us. Give us, Lord, the patience and the courage to nourish that creativity and the strength and the persistence to express it. And now, Almighty God and Father, let us not harbor anything in our hearts that might spoil our fellowship with you or with one another. Work with us and within us. Do what you will with us. Make of us what you want. Change us as we need to be changed. And use us as your will requires. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior, who taught us to pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Well, now you are in for a delight as we welcome uh, to our, our worship experience this morning, the Reverend Ann Sutton. Ann, welcome and thank you for being here. There we go. I'm on. Good morning. Good morning. I am honored to be here. Would you hear the word of God this morning? 
Jesus is telling a parable, and in the middle of the parable, the disciples ask, why are you telling us these silly stories? And Jesus says, to you it has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been given. For to those who have, more will be given, and they will have an abundance. But from those who have nothing, even what they have will be taken away. The reason I speak to them in parables is that seeing that they do not perceive and hearing, they do not listen, nor do they understand. With them, indeed, it is fulfilled in the prophecy of Isaiah that says, You will indeed listen, but never understand. You will indeed look, but never perceive, for this people's heart has grown dull, and their ears are hard of hearing, and they have shut their eyes so that they, they may not look with their eyes or listen with their ears and understand with their heart, thank you children's sermon, understand with their heart and turn, and I would heal them. But blessed are you. Blessed are your eyes, for they shall see, and your ears, for they shall hear. Truly, I tell you, many prophets and righteous people long to see what you see, but did not see it, and to hear what you heard, and they did not hear it. Lord, would you bless the reading of this word, and let it settle into our hearts that we might, that we might hear and see in your way. Amen. I am so honored to be here today. I have been here in uh, First Methodist Alexandria many times for uh, many kinds of meetings, Curcio and Board of Ministry and all kinds of gatherings of pastors. And I have walked the hallways and admired each of those beautiful paintings. And I have sat here in this room and am moved by this colossal piece of artwork oh my goodness to stand in front of this is a little just a little intimidating but I will tell you that often when we have been here for long all-day sessions and I have lost interest in whatever it was anybody was trying to say I have counted the little gold pieces between the bricks I am like a child, the shiny things. I'm going to look at the shiny things. And so if, if you are not engaged with me, not a problem. Look at the shiny things. It'll be okay. I want to thank Ariel for inviting me. It's, a, it's really, it's a, it's a lovely honor. And, and I am an artist, but I'm a, if you're a golfer, there are duffers. You know, and you're happy playing golf. You're not ever going to win anything unless you're on a really good scramble team and somebody drags you along. Well, the same way in art, I, in fact, I gave up golf so I could put my time into art, and I'm never going to be a Picasso, I'm never going to be a Van Gogh, but I might draw a picture, too, that makes me happy. And that's enough. And that's enough. So, so to come and to share with you today, and I'm going to tell you about my drawing experience and how... I've come to see. Now, I believe that everyone can draw. My father was a civil engineer, and he would come home at night, and he would unroll the plans that had been marked up and were no longer of value, and we took our crayons. We didn't have markers then. We took our crayons, and we drew, as children do, with that wonderful abandon, and we drew crooked houses and trees and sons. And without thinking about it, we drew anything because we could draw anything. And we colored and we told stories. It's just one of my favorite things. We got down on the ground and we drew all together and the colors went everywhere. And I bet some of you have had some pictures like this on your refrigerators. And they were absolute works of art. There we go. Oh, we got to do the sun. But then we grew up and we grew a little more. And we continued to draw until somebody said, that looks stupid. 
or somebody that's truly gifted, we looked at what they were drawing and we realized that our drawing didn't look like that drawing. And before you know it, we quit. It disappeared. What we did with complete, no, not self-conscious at all, we just put it away. We just ended it. And I'm so proud of you because I walked down the hallway where you have the children's exhibit. You were helping some of those children find their way from the I can draw, I can't draw, but what they're discovering is that they will be drawing and you are nurturing the artist for the next generation. Well, I lost, I lost, I grew up, I got busy doing a thousand other things. I wasn't happy with what I drew, and I put it away. And I went off to college, got married, and had kids, went into ministry, yada, 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 yada. My life was full. And at some point, this little urge kept coming back. I went to Cambodia on, an, on a on mission trip a long time ago. The first time I went to Cambodia, the information on the country that I pre-read was that in Cambodia, there was only one ATM machine. That is not so anymore. But it was not developed. We were going to help with a, we went to help with a vacation Bible school and to build a fence around a church to protect the property. I went, we had a grand time. It was such an immersion into a different culture. And the most amazing thing was that in Cambodia, other than, okay, I'm, I'm just, I want to be somewhere where it's not like it is at home. That's my, that's, that's my happy place. Of course, you can't do it forever, but, you know, we did it. And, uh, but I saw the church in Cambodia. And even though I couldn't understand the language, we would go to worship, couldn't understand a word, but they were Methodist. It was us there. We took pictures. And this was before iPhones, and this was before we could put it on a file and share it with somebody. We all went with our little cameras, and when we'd have a group, group picture taken, we'd have a stack of 20 cameras and whoever's taking the picture would go, here we go, one, two, you know, we had to do that with our cameras. Well, we got home and we put all our pictures together. And they were wonderful, but something was missing. There was just something about those pictures that, it was, it was the picture, we took those pictures, but it just, it just wasn't right. And then I realized that what I saw in the faces of the people, what I saw in some way that couldn't be captured in a picture, I was going to have to go back and do a different way. And I went back to Cambodia, picked up a sketchbook and a mechanical pencil, and went back to begin to draw. Now, Cambodia was a safe place to learn how to draw because nobody knew me there. And nobody would say, that's dumb. And nobody would say, that looks like it was drawn by a kindergartner. And um, it, was, it worked. And I began to draw. And then I began to get more involved with drawing and began to learn some things. And began to practice and practice and practice. You draw a thousand dumb pictures. But everyone is adding to, everyone is, every single picture is the next stroke to the picture you really want to draw. Every stroke, every, every color. And I learned about line, and I learned about composition, I learned about value. And see, I haven't even said color, have I? Color is the last thing you need to learn about. Because the first thing you need to do is to learn how to see. When you, when you draw that, literally this, I, I've done some plein air. Plein air means to sit down on the side of the road and draw or paint what you see. It makes you slow down. 
You have to pay attention. So the first, the first thing you have to do to, 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 to walk this way is, is, to, is to slow down enough that you can see. To slow down enough that details and structure and possibilities begin to unfold for you. To see, to see. Let me get one more thing on here and then we're going to go back to the scripture. Yes, Dorlan, I think so too. That is the best sound in the sanctuary. Y'all are alive. You got babies among you. Woo! And I tell you what, being, being in worship, man, this two years of COVID have been hard. And you're back. And I get to be with you today. And this feels like church. This feels good. And I know, I know all, everybody, everybody's struggling to put all those pieces back. Oh, but look. And here you're having this great art festival. Now, let me tell you that I know that if I had submitted, I didn't realize that this, this was a juried selection. And if I had put my stuff in, I would not have made it. So I'm feeling real lucky getting to be the pastor, the preacher, to show up for this event. So I'm feeling pretty good about that. But I need to let that dry a minute. That, in watercolor terms, that's what we call wet on wet. You're just getting as much detail, it's, it's big detail, in the wet as you can. So here we're going to talk about scripture and we're going to let that dry just a little bit. Jesus is talking about some people will hear, but not hear. Some people will see, but not see. And he's in the middle of a parable and the parable is this. He's talking about a sower that has gone out to to spread the seeds. For those of you that are gardeners, and if any of you are, are serious farmers, seed is just so valuable and expensive. You don't waste a single seed because that's your profit. You've got to profit off what that seed will produce. And this sower is not a modern farmer because this sower has a great bag of seed. Remember, Jesus is telling a story. Because he wants to tell us something about the kingdom. And the sower has this great bag of seed. And the, and the sower is, has all the, all the extravagance of sowing the seed everywhere. Doesn't you just need to put it in the special place? And in fact, the sower, first he sows the seed on the, on the, on the road. And the birds come in. Now the birds need to be fed. But there will be no profit from this seed. And then he throws the seed a little wider and it goes off the edge of the road and it goes into the hard places and it's going to grow. But as soon as the July sun hits it, it will die and never produce. And then he throws it even wider and it goes down into the ditches among the brambles and the thorns. I like the thorns up there. I'm grooving the thorns. Um, it, it's going to get choked out. There's no way to reap, even if it grows up. It will be stunted and produce so little. But some of that grain, some of that grace that the sower throws out is going to fall in the good ground. And it's going to produce fruit. It's going to multiply. And it's not only going to feed the people that... Oh, it's not, well, see, see, I'm, I'm, I'm piddling with the parables, so to speak. Not only will the people that receive it be blessed, but they're going to bless other people. And the disciples are saying, why are you telling us this story? Because Jesus knew the reality of how some people would hear and some people simply wouldn't. You never know. In the preaching experience, People you would never guess will come up and say, I heard this today, and you're going, I didn't say that. Or people that you're preaching at 
are just oblivious to the fact that you're preaching at them. It doesn't matter, you know, all kinds of things happen. But for, for today, what is the seed? Certainly the seed is the grace and the knowing of Christ. But for today, for argument's sake, for, for sermon purposes, let's say that the seed that you receive, the grace you receive, is for you to be able to see. That you can see the kingdom. That you can see Christ. And that you, in fact, can be seen as well. That you receive in this graceful act the gift of seeing. Because for me, to be able to paint at all, the first gift is to be able to see so that I can communicate it through the painting. You have such fabulous examples all through this building of artists who have seen something and turned it into something tangible so you can see what they saw. That's the artistic purpose, to, for, to share with you what they have seen. But what if this gift is so that we can see, what if we can see like Jesus? Now, there are so many skills in art that I could draw parallels for about line and form and shadow and value and composition, but I want to talk with you about perspective. Some of the simple rules that I use in my drawings about perspective help me understand in the painting what is close and what is far. Let's do a little exercise of perspective. If you'll take your thumb... Got a thumb? Take your thumb, and your thumb is much smaller than that sunflower, that big blossom. But if you hold your thumb to the sunflower, depending on how far you are in the room, you can block it out. But also, if you change eye, don't move your thumb, don't move your thumb, just change which eye you closed. I have to do that, you know, it's around. Does the sunflower move? It should. If you, if you focus with one eye and then change to the other eye, your thumb, even if you don't move, the line of your eye is going to move. You have experienced perspective. Perspective gives depth. Perspective, you have two perfect examples out in the, your hallway here. When you walk into this building, do you ever feel like you could walk up that road in that painting right there at the end of the hallway? That is perfectly placed. It's a perfect example of perspective where you think or you wish you could walk right into that painting right down that road. And if you turn to the, to the, from the painting to the right hand side, there's a blue painting. Same thing. Two excellent examples of perspective. But let me give you a, a perspective. Perspective will let us move into a painting, but perspective will also locate you. Now, for me to find the center line of this building is a piece of cake. Because we've got doors. And, and wherever you move, the view here is different from the view here. As an artist, if I was going to paint, if we lined four artists up across the front of this room and said, paint that view, you would have four basically the same, but basically different views. And if I locate myself here in the center, I have so many visual cues, doors, peaks, rafters, it's, it's easy to locate myself. Perspective helps us locate ourselves. Scott and I went to see Hamilton in New York, and I had connection to some really great tickets. I did not know how great they were until we came into the building, and we're getting seated. We find our seats, and I'm about to sit down, but I'm going to locate myself first. And so I look at the stage, and I am eye level with the actors. When they come onto the stage, I'm not below them, I'm not on the front, we're not in the front row where we're looking up. We are eye level with the actors. And then I do my little room thing and I realize these 
are the two best seats in the house. And a man comes in and he settles his family and he gets his kids seated and then he sits down and he does the same thing. But he's here. And he goes, and who are you? (laughs) Because he realizes he is three seats off the best seat in the house. And my mama taught me to be nice so I didn't say anything. But inside I said, and I'm the person with the best seat in the house. (laughs) Perspective helps us locate where we are. And if we've been given this gift of trying, or or if we're open to this gift of seeing like Jesus, we see the world and we see ourselves in another perspective. When I was in Cambodia, I saw faith in in another perspective. I saw faith, uh, like I said, set in a worship service, didn't understand a word, nothing. They speak the the language Khmer, didn't understand a single word, but you have never lived until you've heard, um, oh, what's that old Gaither song? Um, Da, 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 da. Anyway, they're singing this familiar hymn in Khmer, I can't understand a word, but I'm just singing along, happy as I can be. And then at the um, at the offering, they didn't pass the plate. They didn't let you sit in your seat. You had to get up, and you had to come down front, and you had to personally put your stuff, your gift, in the container. And they're playing music, and it's wonderful. And those people just didn't get in a line and walk. They danced and gave their gift in joy. I learned to see the children of God with faces that were shaped different, whose voices and traditions were different. And I saw the kingdom of God there, and I I felt really rebellious because... I got to preach about the kingdom of God in a land called the kingdom of Cambodia where they have a king and queen and their pictures are hanging on the wall. And when I talked about the kingdom of God in the kingdom of Cambodia, well, I felt just a little subversive. I felt like, okay... I've had some other experiences with what it means to see the kingdom in some other ways. The ministry that I've discovered in my retirement is the ministry of going to the airport a couple of afternoons a week and there are some immigrants who've been released from detention. They've been vetted They've come here. We only get the women. The men go, in fact, I think the men are released and they come to the airport here in in, uh, Alexandria. But we get the women. Anywhere from two to five women will show up. Some of them are plane savvy and they they, they, they didn't drive. None of them drove here, trust me. They have walked through the jungle They have gone places I would never go. They are the bravest people I know. And yet they arrive at our airport and they may or may not have flown before. Most of them don't have any English. And they are going to have to catch, I'm going to help them catch a plane in Lafayette and teach them how to read the arrivals board, the departures board, so when they are in Atlanta or Houston or Dallas, they can look at the board and find their next flight. And I'm like a mother hen. All of us, there's a little team of us that do this. And, and we've created a space where these women can, can arrive and we help them get their boarding passes. We help them tune into the Wi-Fi and they will talk to their families for the first time. It will be the first time many of them 
have talked to their families on their, on their phones. And there are tears, and then they are so afraid because they don't know how to do an airplane. And I get them in the TSA line, and I line them up and make sure they have their boarding passes and make sure they have their IDs. And I put my arm around them, and I call their name, and I say, read the board, read the board, you know, try one more time. And we're using Google Translate because I don't speak any Spanish. But we've had Russians and Hispanic, and uh, we helped a, a couple of women from all over, the, all over the world. And here's the deal. Our, our immigration system is this huge mess with all, kind, all kinds of complex issues. I, I, I can't even. But when I look at these beautiful young women who've come so far, I see daughters of God who simply in that moment need kindness. And so I put my arm around them and I read their name and I say where they're going and I just I cluck like a mother hen. And I try to send them through TSA with a little confidence that they are, that these women who have walked through the jungles, wade across rivers, seen things I don't even want to see, they are almost home. And I try to see them as Christ would see them. And see, that's, that's the problem when we have our eyes spiritually opened. And we begin to pay attention to the world. There is so much beauty. I love, if you'll look at my sketchbooks, I draw flowers and lakes and mountains and beautiful places. I love those things. And, uh, but also your eyes get open to the hard places. And the places that are not so beautiful. And the brokenness and the violence. And if we're going to have the eyes of God in the midst of that, we cannot, that is surely, remember this, the seed that got gobbled up by the, by the birds? If we do not see the hard parts, sometimes God calls us to see the hard parts. And the gift that we have when we see the hard parts is that we see them first to give witness that this is hard or this is unjust are sometimes just unkind. And then we are able to see with hope and we give witness to what the possibility could be. Because seeing, seeing is a, seeing's a hard thing. Seeing is a hard gift to receive. Because I'm telling you, there are some things I don't want to see. There are things I don't want to see. But God opens our eyes and says, if you see it, because see, seeing, it's a dangerous thing. Now, I believe, in fact, um, Elizabeth said this morning, we were talking, she introduced one of the songs, and she said, if you can walk, you can dance. If you can speak or breathe even, you can sing. And I believe, theoretically, that if you can pick up a pencil, you can draw. In fact, when I began to draw in this, in this second part of my life, I was a part of some online communities that basically, they weren't for fancy artists, they weren't for trained artists, they were people who wanted to learn how to draw. And their premise was, everybody can draw. And their first assignment was to go buy an ink pen and a sketchbook or a notebook. Just start. And from there... I learned, relearned skills and courage. Oh my gosh, it took so much courage. It took so much courage. But I do believe that everyone can draw, except, I have to confess, I don't think that I've ever seen my husband, Scott, who I adore in every way, I don't think I've ever seen him draw anything in our 45 years of marriage. Not a stick figure, not a... Not a, not a nothing, not even directions on the back of a napkin. But what he has, as we have walked this world together and traveled and done so much, is sometimes he'll slip up behind me and whisper in my ear and say, there's your painting. Because he can see the beauty and the composition and what is there. But seeing, well, 
Let's put some reflections in here. We have these lovely palm trees. And by the way, this is, um, this is Angkor Wat. This is a temple, 1300. It was built in the 1300s. It was lost to the jungle. And today it is this place of mystery and beauty and, and uh, just this extraordinary place. And the first thing they do when you arrive at this, this complex of these are, are they're just acres, they're miles of temples. And when they bring you to this first temple, they take you to the reflecting pond where not only can you see the primary temple, but it's all reflected right here in the water. It's a beautiful thing to see. But seeing really is dangerous. There we go. Seeing is very dangerous. Years ago, Ariel will appreciate this. The first time I went to conference, I realized that I was seeing things happen that I didn't understand. It was a continuing conversation over years of work in the Methodist Church. And I realized that my first time I was watching things that I did not understand. I was hearing things that I did not understand, that everything that was said on the conference floor was nuanced with something that had happened before. Because you don't say anything on the conference floor that doesn't have 39 other meanings and 39 other interpretations. So, but I come home for conference and I'm, I'm walking and I'm praying and I'm trying to figure out what is it I've heard, what is it I've seen. And I can tell you the place in the neighborhood, the cul-de-sac where I was turning, where as near as I've ever heard the voice of God, I heard this voice that said, what good is it to see if you're not willing to do? Oops. What good is it if you desire to see if you're not willing to do? Well, that has stayed with me for 30 years of ministry. So my friends, I hope that God will grant you the gift to sometimes see in that magical moment the kingdom of God that is among you. I hope that those times when you look at what is a stranger, that you will see them as a child of God and offer a, a deep and warm hospitality and that in turn it's offered to you. But I want to warn you, seeing is very, very dangerous. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you. Amen. Friends, help me thank Ann for bringing such a wonderful message this morning. What a great blessing you have brought us as we get to celebrate again the Tom Pate Memorial Arts Festival. So thank you for, for helping us bring it back in such a grand way. Well, there are ways in which we can see and do love God and love others in the life of this church. Just a couple of things I want to lift up to you. Uh, the gathering will be back uh, this Wednesday night with a wonderful meal. And uh, because it is the Arts Festival, we're going to do something that uh, Jean, Reverend Jean, taught us back in February. We uh, had a study on prayer, and we did a little exercise, the uh, I don't even know what to call it. It was prayer and art or the art of prayer or uh, it was where I had a great appreciation for the painting that Joe Crouch is his, his favorite uh, painting that we have in our permanent collection is not my favorite but now I have a new appreciation for it uh, because of what he saw in it. And so we will uh, do, it, it was lots of fun and we had a, a, great, uh, a great time with it. So we'll, we will revisit that but we will use the pieces from the Tom Payton Collect or the Tom Payton Arts Festival in the Fellowship Hall as uh, our medium for that. So I hope you will come uh, for that uh, Bible study time of prayer and share. 
Uh, in addition, there are other things going on in the festival this week. So Friday night is Jazz on Jackson with our own Elizabeth Nix. Uh, so Elizabeth and friends in the courtyard from 6 o'clock to 8 o'clock. That's this Friday night. And then Children's Park Day is on this Saturday beginning at 10 o'clock. You'll need to register for that. All that information is on the insert. Oh, this is not the insert. But you have an insert in your uh, bulletin that you a rundown of all the good stuff going on for the arts festival this week and then just a quick reminder tomorrow night is the leadership board meeting at 5 30 in the transitions room uh, all are invited if you want to know what's going on in the life of the church if you want to lend your voice to the conversation please come do that and join us you can either join us in person or there is a way to also join us online but i invite you to come in person and join in on that conversation other things going on Life of the Church are on the back of your bulletin in the calendar, and I just invite you to be a part of that. The best way, however, to connect is uh, to make this place your place. If you'd like to become a member of this church, if you're ready to do that, we'd love to celebrate that decision with you. I invite you to come forward as we stand to sing the closing hymn, but if that makes you nervous, then just see me after the worship service. Let's stand and sing our closing song. Our closing hymn today can be found in your black The Faith We Sing books, number 2214, Lead Me, Guide Me. That's number 2214.
I'm going to invite you to get a head start because I know people are going to want to hug your neck, shake your hand, uh, and share appreciations for the great word that we received this day. I want to invite you to go forth. Go forth from this place looking, seeing, with our eyes open for the ways in which God is moving and in the needs of our community. Take the light of Christ with you where you work, where you play, and where you live. And may the peace of God be with you this day and forevermore. Amen. Amen.